Uh, so hey everyone, we are um, here from Datadog. Uh, we're going to talk about our journey connecting millions of containers with gRPC. Um, so just a few words about our company. Uh, we are multi-cloud monitoring and security products. For those that don't know us, uh, we offer metrics, logs, and traces to our users. Uh, this talk is about is is not a, going to be about how to monitor gRPC uh, using Datadog. It's going to be about how we use Datadog to uh, power the Datadog product. Um, so we're actually a fairly large service. We have tens of thousands of customers. Uh, we store trillions of data points per day. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the kind of challenges that we can have uh, on the back end. And this puts things a bit in, in the perspective. Um, so why do we use gRPC? So originally, we started using it uh, fairly early on, around 2016. Uh, and the main reason to use it was uh, client and server code generation, really based on protobuf. It makes it really easy to basically write applications that communicate over the network. Um, and it supported the language we needed. So the fact that it embeds advanced client-side load balancing was more of a convenient discovery uh, than really a deliberate design choice. Uh, but as the data dog backend become larger and larger, uh, those features uh, actually prove to be something that is really, truly useful to us. Um, OK, so this is a typical setup of a gRPC server uh, service with clients at the top and servers at the bottom. Uh, most services run on many, many replicas. Uh, some services have, can have a lot of replicas, like hundreds of them. Uh, and we use uh, gRPC built-in client-side load balancing uh, to spread the load across the server instances. Uh, we usually do not rely on external load balancer in between services to actually do, do that work. Uh, this helps us save on costs and operations. Uh, so typically, service owners are, are like this approach. Uh, we use DNS for service discovery. Uh, we have no advanced kind of control plane features, although um, that might change in the future. Uh, so while this setup has generally been working really well for us, um, it has also come, come with like some challenges, and actually using gRPC properly in this setup has been an ongoing learning journey. So uh, at first, users at Datadoc were mostly on their own when using gRPC, and uh, soon enough, they bumped into a set of some common problems. So the way we helped our developers to deal with those set of problems is by providing in gRPC wrappers. And uh, here on the slide, you can see examples of some of the issues we try to deal inside of those wrappers. And we are going to discuss some of those in more details later during the presentation. So when working on our uh, gRPC wrappers, we try to be opinionated. So we provide a set of reasonable defaults that works for everybody. Uh, and if we need to expose some features, uh, we usually expose them as a, a set of Boolean flags, try to minimize the UX and uh, make it easier for uh, our users to consume it. So this approach has a nice uh, property, so we also can transparently deal with some of the uh, problems, even without user involvement, by uh, adding new default behaviors uh, to our wrappers. Okay, so the first thing that we uh, that we take care of uh, in our wrapper libraries is failure detection. Um, so one scenario that is particularly common in a in a setup like Datadog is uh, silent connection drops. Uh, so that typically happens when a host is shut down from the network. Um, and so, how does gRPC actually handle this scenario? Um, so by default, it doesn't really do anything special. Um, it actually relies on the Linux kernel to detect that a link has failed. Um, and so in a typical setup of, a, uh, like if you install any distribution of Linux, it will and use the default. Uh, it's going to take a whole 15 minutes in order for the kernel to detect that the link is bad. Uh, so this is the amount of time you're going to get errors uh, from uh, for gRPC server um, that has a failed link. Um, so can we do better than that? Well, gRPC actually has the feature that you need to turn on explicitly in order to make that much better. Uh, this feature is called Keep Alive. So uh, we set that in our wrapper libraries, uh, and we set it by default. We basically think that in our setup, nobody should, uh, everybody should have Keep Alive enabled. So that's an example of one of the things that we uh, that we set up. Uh, so. This has basically completely eliminated this pattern that used to be really common, actually. Um, and 
as we felt like we had a, a good grasp on this issue of failing nodes, uh, we were able to bring failure detection to the next level. So, uh, as you've seen, uh, setting keeper lives allows us to efficiently deal with uh, network problems. But what if network is fine, but uh, an instance of uh, application server is failing due to some other reason? Like, for example, it cannot connect to database. It got misconfigured or some other issue is happening. And gRPC will happily keep sending requests to this failing server, which will uh, increase the error rate for all clients that are connected to it. Uh, here on the screen, you can see a, a diagram for a synthetic test that we run in our environment when our when one server is constantly misbehaving. And uh, the way we deal with this uh, problem is by enabling a newly added gRPC feature, which is called outlier detection. So outlier detection actually uh, works like this. So it allows ejecting a misbehaving server by uh, comparing error rate for this server with the mean value. And it actually has a kind of complex uh, configuration parameters allowing to tune the exaction procedure. Uh, but uh, during some experiments, we came up with a set of reasonable defaults that uh, works for uh, most of our users, and uh, we configure them by default in our wrapper libraries. And as you can see on the bottom diagram, by enabling outlier detection, the impact of misbehaving server can be completely uh, eliminated. So uh, now when we talked about failure uh, detection, uh, let's uh, discuss some other uh, common problems that our gRPC users uh, faced uh, in uh, our environment. So uh, here on the screen, you can see a diagram of uh, uh, CPU utilization that is generated for some of our gRPC server. And at first it might look surprising why some servers will have a lot more load than the others. But uh, the answer why this is happening by default is pretty simple. So uh, the uh, problem here is that by default, gRPC is using peak first as default load balancer, and peak first was work like this. So basically every client picks a single uh, server out of the list of all available servers, and then send requests to uh, this server. And uh, statistically, the probability that the load on the server will be evenly distributed is very low. So uh, what we did to deal with this problem is change the default in our environment. So uh, now we use round robin as the default load balancer and round robin works very differently. So at every client now round robin requests between all available servers and now every server received exactly the same amount of requests. So you can see the impact of this uh, change uh, on the screen and uh, now requests are perfectly balanced. But in practice, we want to have even uh, balanced CPU utilization and uh, not a just number of requests. So this is still not enough. Okay, and so one, one thing to have in mind here is that Service owners typically um, want to actually tune their autoscalers uh, that choose the number of pods uh, according to very like the vastly um, the vast majority of of, of, of service owners actually use CPU based autoscaling, and they would add instances when the CPU uh, the average CPU or um, well when the CPU of their servers is actually uh, going over a threshold for a sustained period of time. And actually, um, the question is, when you have many servers, which number do you take? Uh, typically, you actually, like, one obvious answer could be to take the average, but that means that if some, some servers are having a high CPU usage and others have low CPU usage, uh, then, like, some of them will still get overloaded um, before the autoscaler kicks in. So people typically have to provision autoscaler for the instances that are the worst performing. Um, so here is a... Um, here are the graphs of uh, usage for one of our production services. As you can see on the top, because we use round robin, uh, the requests are perfectly balanced. But on the bottom graph, we see that CPU usage is actually showing this bend effect, where some are around 50% CPU usage, or others around 60%. Um, 
So this is a problem in practice because you have to tune your autoscaler based on the more like the those that seem to have higher CPU usage. Uh, so what's going on under the hood here? It happens that um, our like Round robin is good at uh, balancing requests. It's not good at actually balancing load. And here we have our workloads running on two different generations of CPU. Um, so ideally, you would want CPU usage to be perfectly balanced and not, not the number of requests. Um, and like one thing to keep in mind is that uh, our the team that is responsible for scheduling workloads onto servers doesn't really isn't really interested to in or isn't really able to make sure that all the servers for a given uh, deployment are running on the same kind of instances. Uh, so can we do better than that? Well, some of you that have worked on uh, gRPC very recently will recognize a perfect use for the weighted round robin uh, balancer which is a new feature that was recently added in, uh, in gRPC. And uh, the idea is that servers will communicate their current load uh, in each response, and then clients will weight the number of requests sent to each server according to uh, a computed capacity. So integrating that in our environment was actually really easy. We just, we just had to uh, implement a few interceptors and uh, a time loop that measures CPU usage and plug that into the built-in weighting round robin uh, load balancer. Um, so we do that through our wrappers library again. So this can be enabled by service owners through a simple boolean. Um, so the results uh, have been actually very impressive. Uh, as you can see on the top graph, CPU usage now after deploying the load reports uh, becomes completely balanced. It becomes a straight line. Uh, and it's now the number of requests per pod that is actually uh, different according to the server performance. Uh, so the nice thing really about this feature is that it requires no coordination, no control plane. It's really easy to set up. Um, okay, so as we just sh showed, round robin is a great way to achieve uh, good load balancing. Um, it actually has some also some drawbacks. So let's let's look into that. Um, so this is uh, showing um, each arrow on this diagram is actually showing a connection between a client and a server. And when we use uh, round robin with this client side load balancing kind of setup, uh, the number of the total number of connections is the number of clients multiplied by the number of servers. So each server receives one connection per client. Um, this number can become quite large if you have a lot of clients. Um, and so the question is like, is that a problem in practice? It ends up then it is because those connections are cheap, but when we have thousands of connections, we, uh, they all sum up and uh, resources that are consumed by those uh, connections uh, add up as well. So here on the screen, you can see a screenshot of a Datadog profiler applied to one of our Go gRPC servers. And uh, as you can see, uh, a lot of memory, like almost two gigabytes, are spent on uh, some internal gRPC buffers. So we um, dig deeper to investigate what's going on there. So in order to understand the problem, let's consider a typical uh, gRPC setup for a Golang server. So here uh, you can see a connection, and every connection in uh, gRPC Go allocates two buffers. Uh, one for reads and one for writes. And uh, gRPC Go uses those buffers to proxy requests to underlying network socket. Uh, the corresponding sizes of them are 32 and 64 case. Uh, and uh, actually those buffers help to reduce, uh, to improve performance because uh, accessing network socket is uh, expensive because it requires network calls and accessing data in memory is much faster. So by using those buffers, we can improve performance. But uh, let's consider what happens if we use round robin and now we have thousands of connections. So just those two buffers can account for a gigabytes of memory on every server, which like, uh, account for terabytes of memory across all our environment. So uh, the uh, one more uh, problem here is that in round robin case, those uh, the effect of those buffers is uh, not that visible because uh, a lot of the connections are not heavily utilized. Like we have thousands of connections, but a lot of them are mostly idle and uh, buffers just sit there without uh, helping us a lot.
So what we did, we worked with uh, gRPC team and uh, introduced a optional mechanism that can, uh, allows to share uh, buffers between connections. So we use sync pool, which is a uh, GoLang abstractions for sharing uh, objects between concurrent Go requests. And uh, we wrote some logic to release the buffers and make them available for other connections uh, when necessary. So uh, after we tested this uh, feature on one of our uh, gRPC servers, the results uh, were really good. So we saw a 40% memory decrease with no visible uh, CPU impact. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this work, here is a link to the uh, pull request where we um, did this work and provide some benchmark results. But actually here I must mention that Golang is not the only language where we have uh, problems with uh, too many connections generated by round drop. Okay, so um, this is again uh, the same diagram just showing the connections for, for one client. Uh, and here we are talking about Python. So one thing that we quickly discovered when we uh, when we investigated these problems of too many connections kind of causing too much resource usage, that the reality doesn't really look like this. It actually looks like this. So um, each Python process looks like it's uh, opening not just one connection to each server, but a bunch of them. Um, so why is that? Uh, well. A lot of popular Python frameworks are actually spawning not just one process um, to process requests, but it's spawning a bunch of them. And they, they, they cannot really share a gRPC runtime. They cannot really share connections. So um, in our environment, typically, uh, the servers that are serving our large Python monolithic application, uh, they run thousands of process, uh, processes, which means that in this case, we will have uh, dozens of connections per clients to each server. Um, so the way we uh, improve the situation here is simply by uh, running uh, an, an external connection pooler. Uh, we use an envoy proxy for that, running it as a sidecar uh, that the, um, the Python process is connected to, and that is then responsible for doing the round robin for us. Uh, so by doing that, we were able to um, make Python on par with our other languages, um, but we didn't really actually solve the problem. Uh, we just like greatly improved the number of connections uh, in the case of Python. Uh, so can we do better than that? So the thing that we think should solve the root cause of too many connection problem is subsetting. And the idea behind subsetting is really simple. So uh, what we are gonna do, we will make every client to choose a subset out of all available servers and then round robin request between them. So a useful way to think about subsetting is this. Uh, you can think that it's something that's in, uh, in the middle of two extreme, which are peak first and round robin. If you compare it to peak first, it still opens more connections because uh, every client is connected to a subset, not to a single server, but it's still way less than in case of round robin. But uh, because of the fact that we are opening uh, more connections, we can uh, uh, have a better uh, load utilization on the server uh, than we have with Peak First. So uh, the only way of subsetting we implemented in our infrastructure so far is random subsetting. And the algorithm here is uh, trivial. Basically, we uh, just pick a random set of hosts on every client and then round robin request between them. But the results, when we applied it to one of our uh, servers, and this particular server has like uh, thousands of clients. Um, so as you can see, the number of connection as well as memory utilization on the server uh, reduced a lot. But uh, the CPU uh, impact was not that great. Uh, that's once again because uh, random subsetting has exactly the same problem as pure peak first. So uh, the imbalance between the most and the least utilized server now grows and service owners will have to account for that when allocating resources for their server. But once again, it might be a fair trade-off for some uh, type of applications, but still it's, it doesn't feel like it's a generic solution we can enable by default for everybody. 
So uh, the thing we are doing right now, we are trying to uh, closely work with the gRPC maintainers and try to introduce a standard way of doing subsetting uh, in gRPC by exploring a smarter algorithms uh, of choosing subsets on the client as well as the algorithms, how we can distribute load when subset is already chosen. Uh, but uh, this is still work in progress. You can see a link uh, to the corresponding uh, gRPC proposal on the screen. Uh, and it's too early to share any results of this work yet. That's what's it. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe we need some mics. Questions? Um, wondering, uh, are you expecting that with random subsetting being taken out and deterministing subsetting coming in that the CPU load will be better balanced across servers? Is that the expected outcome? So, uh, yes, uh, basically with deterministic subsetting, there are some well-established algorithms. Uh, we looked at the ones that used to Google and the Twitter aperture, and actually, it is possible to achieve perfect uh, request and connection distribution if you use deterministic subset. The problem with those algorithms is that they are require coordination between client, and that's kind of the point where we get some pushback. So that's why we exploring different options of uh, doing this, and we might we might may end up not contributing de deterministic subset into gRPC. I just to you follow to know some approaches that work without coordination. Like, please, please come and talk to us. Just to follow up, it may be a naive question, but like sharing buffers between the connections, uh, like you did for Go, is not a possible solution for the Python implementation. I don't think that Python is affected by the same problem because it's more specific how Go was implemented. And I don't want to dig into too much technical details, but yeah, I don't think it applies to Python. Okay. Uh, so we, uh, hi, my name is Sai, uh, we use subsetting at our company and we have, we leave it to the teams to decide what the subset size should be. I'm curious if you guys have any data on like how you decide the subset based on number of clients and servers. So, uh, we have a few teams, uh, as we said, that do that and, uh, they choose the subset side, size. So it's the same. Um, for us, it's a little cumbersome because we don't have a centralized way to control all clients. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't have any sort of control plane that can kind of dynamically inform all clients that they should increase or like which subset size they should use. Um, but yeah, basically this is like... So is, uh, uh, is this some kind of like configuration that the team needs to change and then roll out uh, to all the clients? Yeah, it does. It, you need to pass this information at client creation. Thank you. Yeah, we also look in at options where, like, we can somehow calculate the optimal subset size based on some metrics, but I'm not sure if it's feasible. Okay. So, in case of weighted round topping, you said that. Here, hang on, Sanjay. In case of weighted round robin, you said the load was reported back to the client either out of band or on the or along with the RP series. So in your case, what was it? Out of uh, band? So or? we use the default, which is uh, within re response to radars. I think both would have worked equally well. But, uh... OK. Because if it was reported out of band or something, you could actually also use that to figure out which subset to choose or where to send the RPCs and all that stuff. Even pick first can be used with that, I was thinking. Yeah, we're exploring those options like uh, trying to adjust, uh, like disconnect from most connected servers. But yeah, as I said, we don't have results yet. I have a question for you guys. Um, so going back to setting up keep alive parameters on the uh, server, I'm wondering if on in your services, are, is, are those turned on by default? Or in if so, what are like the how do you determine the default values for those? Uh, so actually, it's pretty interesting. I didn't get into details here, but we set it to a pretty high value because the main thing 
in my opinion, the gRPC tipple lives are doing. So the mechanism is that it sends ping regularly, and you can configure the interval and the timeout. Uh, but regardless of the interval that you put, um, it sets TCP user timeout on the socket. And this is what has the, like, it redu basically reduces this window of 15 minutes to 15 seconds, uh, which in most cases is yeah, and the actual value I think is still fifteen minutes for yeah. the, so. uh, but we don't care about about the keep alive themselves. Thank you. And just to mention, historically, I've been to to uh, like circle back on the beginning of the presentation. People have been kind of tuning these keep alive parameters crazily. Uh, setting them in ways that actually cause more problems than we solve. So that's one of the reasons why centralizing that. After the initial subset is computed and then the outlier detection evicts the host, what happens with the subset? Uh, so in our setup, nothing. Uh, it just re reduces the size of the subset. And so outlier detection. Um, Without my detection, there is no risk of actually like shut, like removing all the servers of the subset uh, because you're only looking at the subset and ejecting outliers. So um, like all servers cannot be outlier. Yeah, and there is a protection. You can configure max uh, ejected host. I think it's the default to 10%. So you will never eject more than 10% of your server. 